Another essential aspect of the liturgy that's absolutely necessary to understand in the celebration of the liturgy is the church's concern with unity and diversity. Above all else, the church wants us to be able to manifest our unity in the celebration of the liturgy. There is no better way to express this unity than our participation in the texts, the postures, and the gestures that are used during the Mass. Here's what the Church herself says about unity in the liturgy. In the celebration of Mass, the faithful form a holy people, a people of God's own possession, a royal priesthood, so that they may give thanks to God and offer the unblemished sacrificial victim, not only by the means of the hands of the priest, but also together with him, so that they learned to offer their very selves. They should, moreover, take care to show this by their deep religious sense and their charity toward brothers and sisters who participate with them in the same celebration. Now here's where the church gets really serious on this point about unity manifested in the liturgy. At the end of that paragraph, she says, they are consequently to avoid any appearance of singularity or division, keeping in mind that they have only one Father in heaven and hence are all brothers and sisters one to the other. The church goes on further in the next paragraph to suggest that this unity manifests itself beautifully in the way that the faithful observe the texts, the gestures, and the postures together. Now, the church's overriding concern might be the expression of unity in the liturgical celebration, but she also understands that there is room for legitimate diversity. Perhaps Vatican II was inspired by the words in 1959 of St. Pope John XXIII when he said, unity in all things, diversity in doubtful things, but charity in all things. So in the celebration of the liturgy, there is room for legitimate diversity. To highlight this question of legitimate diversity in the liturgy, let me tell you the story that St. Augustine recounts in his letter to Januarius. Augustine says that when he and his mother moved from Milan to Rome, his mother became very upset because in Rome, the church there didn't fast on the same day as they had when they were in Milan. And she was very disturbed by this, and Augustine sought the counsel of St. Ambrose. Ambrose gave these wise words. When I am in Rome, I fast on the day the Romans fast. When I am not in Rome, I do not fast on those days. This, by the way, is the origin of the phrase, when in Rome, do as the Romans do. There is another kind of diversity that the church does not encourage in the liturgy, and I call it idiosyncratic diversity. This is what the church talks about when she says singularity of appearance. That means I do in the liturgy what I want to do rather than what the church does. Let me give you a couple of examples. The first example is this, and it's a very delicate example because the reception of communion for Catholics is such a profound and significant moment. The American bishops in the general instruction have said that the gesture of reverence before the reception of communion is a slight bow of the head. Now you might say to me, but it's more reverent to genuflect before receiving communion. And perhaps it is. The church asks us this singular gesture the slight bow of the head, because it is a gesture we can all do. Not all of us are able to genuflect. Here's what I recommend. Follow in obedience what the Missal says, but let the simple bow of your head be a genuflection in your heart. Sometimes in the distribution of communion, I say the body of Christ, and the response comes back to me, not amen, but we are. Well, it's not untrue, but it's not the response that the church gives us. And this idiosyncratic diversity disrupts that moment of communion. All of a sudden it becomes what the communicant wants rather than what the church offers. 
So to conclude, there is a double challenge for us in the question of diversity. The challenge is first that we be obedient to the rights of the church as they are given. And secondly, that we be charitable to one another when we see that others do not follow the rubrics the way they should. I like to think of this, when entering the liturgy, we should enter calmly, taking as our model St. John the Baptist, who said, I must decrease so that Christ may increase. In the end, less of me, more of Christ.